but we have this treasure in clay pots so that the awesome power belongs to God and doesn't come from us. We are experiencing all kinds of trouble, but we aren't crushed. We are confused, but we aren't depressed. We are harassed, but we are never abandoned. We are knocked down, but we are not knocked out. We always carry Jesus' death around in our bodies so that Jesus' life can also be seen in our bodies. We who are alive are always being handed over to death for Jesus' sake so that Jesus' life can also be seen in our bodies that are dying. So death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. developed as a time of interior reflection and confession in the centuries after the life of Jesus. This season is the beginning of compassion for ourselves and others as we go inward to see and acknowledge our humanity. It is the beginning of healing to tell the truth. The Latin origins of the word confess mean to study and acknowledge. And so during Lent, we look inward for a while to see who we are. So let us pray together this prayer of confession. 
Creator God, we are bodies fashioned by your hand in your own image, shapes and colors of diverse and immense beauty. And yet too often we have ignored the sacred nature of our physical lives. The holy vessels you have fashioned are tired and suffering, ravaged by months of disrupted rhythms and ailment. Our fragility has come into full view and we are frightened. We cannot fathom the proportions of loss and so we look away, sometimes even from our own needs. Help us, healer, show us your strength, forgive our inertia, move us to move one step at a time toward greater care. In this silence, we sense and acknowledge our yearning for wholeness. Know this, God's love and grace surround you no matter what. You are a precious and holy vessel right now. Christ's light is a treasure given freely for you, for me, and for all. Take a deep breath to let this truth fill you and breathe out the relief of insurance of forgiveness and unconditional love. I invite you to imagine that love that you are receiving and surrounds you extending to those who, who may be next to you in close proximity. Imagine extending beyond the walls of your house into the neighborhood, the wider community, the church, and see it spreading like the sun, expanding to all of our world. Let this be our peace. Amen. We travel upon the ark in mud and rain, our oars promises from God. We live and the rest of humanity dies. We travel upon the waves, fastening our lives to the ropes of corpses filling the skies. But between heaven and us is an opening, a porthole for a supplication. Why, Lord, have you saved us alone from among all the people and creatures? And where are you casting us now? To your other land? To our first home? Into the leaves of death? Into the wind of life? In us, in our arteries, flows a fear of the sun. We despair of the light. We despair, Lord, of a tomorrow in which to start life anew. If only we were not that seedling of creation, of earth and its generations, if only we remained simple clay or ember or something in between, then we would not have to see this world, its Lord, 
and it's held twice over. This past week, as many of you came by to uh, engage in an Ash Wednesday ritual, you said to me when I asked you, how are you? I'm actually fine, but it's such a weird feeling to, to be okay knowing that so many in our world aren't. Our community here in Portola Valley and um, surrounding areas has been affected, but not as deeply impacted as other places in our nation and our world by the pandemic. And now, as many of us have access to wonderful health care, the vaccine news of people receiving their vaccines is rolling in. Now the question is, is how if you had one or have you had two for many of us? But this past Thursday, the Washington Post reported that January had what they're calling a mass casualty every day. Now it's been largely hidden from us because we're all kind of in the arcs of our own homes and our small neighborhoods. And yet we still live with this collective trauma, recognizing that even as our life goes on, so many are struggling. It's been a really odd and, and terrible feeling to watch as so many things are happening around the world and not be able to do much or to have at the same time our life feel so small and isolated. Some of us feel as if we got lucky to be on the ark. We're, we're floating along and we're a little limited, but at least we made it. Others of us feel like we are the ones who are drowning, either through sickness or through the struggle of what the isolation and the impact of the pandemic has had on our economy and our world. The poem for this morning that I pair am pairing with this text of the flood is a pretty dark poem. And, but yet it also helps us get out of the children's version of Noah and the Ark that many of us grew up with. You know, those wonderful pictures of everyone getting on the ark and there being a happily ever after with the rainbow at the end. What was actually happening in the story? What might it have been like on the ark? And what does it mean that sometimes history unfolds this way? Some live, others die. And how do we recover even when we do live? How do we navigate a world that has been shattered and our view of a world that has changed. If you uh, look at the text of the flood, which starts um, in Genesis 8, you'll notice that uh, doing the math, it looks like Noah and his family were on the ark for a year, for an entire year. That sounds a little familiar, doesn't it? They were rushed in with all the animals and cooped up inside while the waters rose and fell and all of creation died. I remember my daughter, I'll never forget telling her this story for the first time and her just saying, that's a terrible story. The flood is an ancient story that was written like many of the stories we find in Genesis to try to help the Hebrew people understand their world. And in ancient stories, waters represent chaos and unknowing. The chaos that we feel when we realize we're not in control. The chaos that Texans must be feeling this week with, when their state with reliably good weather is freezing and they're left without power and heat. The chaos of premature death and the chaos of aging against our will and wishes. 
the chaos of unexpected consequences to our decisions, the chaos of being at the whim of unjust leaders. This story wonders, what does God do with chaos? It's not hard to understand what God's initial response is in the story. Let's just take a sliver of what's best, a little bit of everything, put them all in a boat, Noah and his family and the animals, and see if we can get a hard reset. God does that, but in the end finds that the solution was worse than the problem. God is learning and becoming in this story. God promises to never again destroy the earth. God puts a rainbow in the sky, not to remind the humans, if you notice in the text, but to remind God's self that to never do that again, never destroy all of creation again. It's a big reminder to God that that didn't work. Now, what about the humans in the story? I can imagine them kind of rocking constantly for, for a long time with the effects of being on a boat that long. You can imagine them, their sea legs under them as they walk off the boat and onto dry land for the first time in a year. <laughs> I feel that anxiety now as I think about what's it going to be like for us off of this arc that we've been on the last few months, the last year. What about the humans? Well, I think that this story was written as a narrative form of what theologians call theodicy. Theodicy is the theological problem of why bad things happen or what do we do with suffering? My answer is that I think what the writers were doing is saying, we thought we wanted God to intervene, but that is not what we wanted at all. We thought God would just come in and, and shift everything around and, and strike and, and make people pay for, for all of the awful things happening in the world. We thought we wanted just a clean restart. But instead, what we discovered is we want a God who is with us on our life on the earth. We want a God who makes promises, who makes covenants with us out of love and compassion. We want a God who doesn't rush in for the quick rescue as much as we want that at some times in our lives, but who loves us and helps us work with what already is. We want a God that is, is working with the stuff of this earth rather than wiping it all away. The second stanza of the poem by Adonis is equally dark, actually even a little darker. Note as we listen to it, all that the pronoun all the pronouns are lower case, even for God. If time started anew and waters submerged the face of life and the earth convulsed, and that God rushed to me beseeching, Noah, save the living. I would not concern myself with his request. I would travel upon my ark, removing clay and pebbles from the eyes of the dead. I would open the depths of their being to the flood and whisper in their veins that we have returned from the wilderness, that we have emerged from the cave, that we have changed the sky of years, that we sail without giving in to our fears, that we do not heed the word of that God. Our appointment is with death. 
Our shores are a familiar and pleasing despair, a gelid sea of iron water that we ford to its very ends undeterred, heedless of that God and his word, longing for a different, a new Lord. This poem is so fascinating and, and disturbing, isn't it, at some level. As I've stayed with it the last few weeks, I've realized that it really denotes a change in the, in the author's theology, a change in perspective, imagining what Noah and his family might have felt. There is both an ownership of their lives that comes about and a letting go that happens, an acceptance of death as those who survived, and a less, an acceptance of a less than ideal life. There's a near savoring even of the despair. It's a recognition that we live with some whys that will never be answered. But maybe the right question isn't why, but who, as my friend Annette says. The right question is not why, but who. Who is God? God is with me. God is with the world. God is working with the stuff of our lives. And who am I? I am with God. And because of that, I can also be with the world, working with what is, accepting that life is not happily ever after, and loving anyways. This season of Lent that we're entering this week is about saying things the way they are, that our world is often full of suffering, that God doesn't always rush in to make everything better, that we have not loved the way we wanted to, and we have not been loved the way we wanted to be loved. That we have hurt others without intending to hurt them and, and they have hurt us. And that we will recover from all this. We will recover from all this in deeper maturity, greater capacity for compassion, and that even in the messiness of our world, God is loving and redeeming us. Amen. We shall be known by the company we keep, by the ones who circle around to tend these fires. We shall be known by the ones who sow and reap the seeds of change alive from deep within the earth. It is time now. It is time we lead ourselves into the world. It is time now, and what a time to be alive in this great turning we shall learn to lead in love. We shall be known by the company we keep. By the ones who circle around to tend these fires. We shall be known by the ones who sow and reap the seeds of change alive from deep within the earth. It is time now. It is time now that we thrive. It is time we to the world. It is time now, and what a time to be alive. In this great turning, we shall learn to lead in love. We shall be known by the company we keep. By the ones who circle around to tend these fires. 
We shall be known by the ones who sow and reap the seeds of change of life from deep within the earth. It is time now, it is time now that we thrive. It is time we lead ourselves into the world. Turning, we shall learn to lead in love. In this great turning, we shall learn to lead in love. In this great turning, we shall learn to lead in love. Let us pray. Our God who is in heaven, hallowed be your name your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen <music> 